Welcome to the Avalon Institute Wired to Lead podcast with your hosts Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. The Avalon Institute is on a mission to understand how individuals, teams, and leaders connect with others and the strategies they deploy to achieve the highest levels of success. Before each show, our guests take the Avalon Institute's Cognitive Peak Profile, available on our website at www.avalonleadership.com, and we discuss their unique cognitive leadership strengths. Thanks again for joining us, and here are your hosts, Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. And off we go. Well, we want to welcome our viewers and listeners today uh, for the Wired to Lead podcast. A uh, very, very exciting day for us. We're um, joined by a wonderful uh, director, producer, filmmaker, uh, Sayla Carriott, uh, from Cal- she's calling in uh, or uh, logged in here from California. Um, we are going to be discussing uh, her CPP scoring. Uh, as well as her, her film that's actually getting ready to be released um, on somewhat of a limited basis uh, here in the United States, and then hopefully on, on a, quite a bit uh, of a broader basis as well. Uh, Sayla has been doing a lot of traveling here recently. She's been promoting her uh, film over in India and just returned to the States from the UK, where uh, in the debut in the UK, enormous uh, um, amounts of positive reviews for the film. And again, the name of the film is called The Valley. Um, for anyone who hasn't joined us before, uh, th- this is the Wired to Lead podcast, and we are the Avalon Institute. Um, we will be discussing, in terms of this Wired to Lead um, notion, uh, Sayla has, has been gracious enough to, to work with us and take our CPP assessment that we offer through the Avalon Institute. It's a cognitive peak uh, profile. And the CPP assessment gives us a notion of, of um, how we think, how we make meaning. And so what we're very interested in, in finding out about today and talking with Sayla is how she makes meaning, how she uh, adds context. Um, and essentially, I'm really looking forward to drilling into the creative process uh, and, and get some definition around that um, and understand how she was able to create the movie, uh, The Valley. So uh, specifically, the CPP identifies hardwired traits in the brain. So in other words, it looks at what kind of cognitive activities the brain does efficiently versus some of the activities um, it does a little bit less uh, efficiently, but the the separation being you can also do those well, just not quite as efficiently. Um, And it can give you, I I think, if you contextualize it within your own activity, your own leadership activity, or your, your job, your performance, it can give you some advice or at least grounding on how to optimize that performance um, based on the survey results. The one plug of this uh, podcast is you can log on to avalonleadership.com. You join Avalon, that's free. uh, And then you can order the assessment um, uh, on the Avalon uh, website uh, very easily. Um, But at this point, that's the lead in. I'm going to introduce Cam. Uh, Cam is is the wingman on the podcast here. He's the one who keeps us all sane and and allows us the context to, uh, to do what we do here at Avalon. I also want to introduce our teammate, uh, Sharon Roberts, uh, from uh, uh, logging in today from the UK. And our special guest today, of course, is Sayla. And we are going to be discussing her movie, The Valley, which is a wonderful piece. uh, And we're going to get to that. Let me kick it over to Cam. Cam, say hi to everyone. And then uh, let's jump in here with Sayla. Yeah, thanks, Perry. And Sayla, wonderful to have you here. I'm just ready to jump in and... and, uh, start talking about your project and the way you see the world. Thank you for having me. Well, Kim, let me give you just a little bit of a, let's, let's do a little breakdown here with Sayla. Um, Sayla, I'm going to talk a little bit about your background here because you, you have, a, it, it's fascinating. Uh, and again, we're going to relate the, your background to your CPP scoring. Uh, we'll throw those up on the screen. Uh, Brendan Kalnacki is our producer. He's the one who does all the, all the fun technical stuff. But Sally, you are an active associative thinker, uh, a little bit less on the sequential side or the systems-based thinking. You, you show up as an active listener. You've taken a lot of information from, from uh, what you hear around you. Uh, and we'll, we'll be delving into that a little bit lower on the mover side, um, uh, meaning that you don't necessarily have to move to think. Uh, a little bit uh, lower on the observer side, 
um, which also could mean that you don't get distracted by what you see. A uh, little lower on the reader side, and I am too, uh, believe me. Um, I read what I like to read. <laughs> I read out of my own interest. And if it doesn't interest me, well, that's an issue. Uh, and then you're a little higher on the talker side. So again, you know, Cam, why don't you go ahead and, and maybe uh, talk a little bit about uh, Sayla's scoring uh, just in general, and then let's just jump in with her and see, uh, see how she responds to this. And then we're gonna get to the project. All right, so when I, when I think about a, a high associative and uh, active listener and talker that, um, Sayla, you're, you're, what gets your attention is um, how things are related in the world. Uh, whether they're larger concepts um, around relationships and people. Um, and so watching the trailer of the Valley, this is really about, um, you say, uh, your observations of breakdowns of relationships. Is that, is that right? Yes, I think that's, that's a very good uh, apt uh, observation. Um, it's, the Valley is about you know, anxiety and depression, which is on the rise amongst youth, and the complicated ecosystem that kind of feeds these issues. Um, and really, there's no one magic bullet, one reason why, you know, anxiety and depression increases and gets to a point where someone makes this, you know, fatalistic decision to commit suicide. You know, but there's a whole series of, of things the core of which is depression. Depression is the disease, you know, which like any disease, for example, diabetes is on the rise in, amongst the human population. <clears throat> so is depression. Right. So, you know, the question is, why is this happening? And again, the reasons are very complicated. Right. Um, so the, what we do on the podcast is we look at these scores and we really check in with you about whether the scores resonate. Um, if it makes sense to you or if there's this little discrepancy, right? It's, we want to look at your experience of uh, how you perceive the world. And is this, does this uh, uh, survey results, does it resonate with you? Does it make sense that you sort of see the world as uh, through context and story more than evidence and process? Um, do you get your information through uh, dialogue with others and, and listening? Um, or, or do you see some discrepancy here? Actually, much of it is, is extremely accurate. I was, uh, especially the, the part about listening and, and dialogue. Um, many times, I mean, the part of problem, the information age is we have access to so much information. And um, sometimes I do go through and research like, you know, any given topic, you, if you want to, you could research it for weeks, you know, just googling and finding information on the internet and and sometimes i do do that but many times i will talk to someone who's done that work and say well you know what did you learn about this you know so listening i find i learn so much from because every human being has some particular area of interest and they've actually invested the time and the energy to learn about that area and so, you know, talking to them, you glean so much more information than trying to reproduce all of that work, you know? Right. I, find, I find it very, so that part I felt was really spot on. Um, the, the connecting the dots, the associative, you know, I haven't thought about it in particular that way. And it, it's really food for thought, what you've told me. And um, I do look at the forest rather than the trees. You know, that's kind of, I started out as an engineer and that's one of the frustrations I felt with engineering because it's so <laughs> oriented and you know, you, it, it tends to be very um, specialized. So you learn more and more and more about one little thing, you know, and I, I used to find that frustrating because I wanted to look at the big picture, you know, and you, you can do some of that in management because the higher up you go, the more you're kind of putting all the pieces together into one product, you know, um, so I found management much more fulfilling than being an individual contributor, which is probably what, you know, the, this, the associative pattern that you're relating to. It probably relates to that. Right. Uh, so I was a, um, 
I was a geology major in college, and um, what I was frustrated with was how geology had moved from this sort of uh, these uh, wonderful classical geologists that I worked with at the you know the uh, USGS, the Geological Survey, uh, were were generalists. They would go and they would map uh, the whole mountain range of the Wind Rivers in Wyoming, mm. and um, they it was amazing what the the knowledge base and the breadth that they had. And when I went through, it was um, around again very specific areas, uh, like someone was doing a dissertation on the the bone in the ear uh, you know of a fish um 60 million 60 million years ago and it's like wow i can't do that <laughs> that detail got it but i was great in the field right looking around and tying together all the different uh structure and stratigraphy so Thanks for sharing that. Jared, I want to I want to ask you about that and ask your your perceptions because we've talked about this a, a while as well. Can you add some context? Because you know you show up as in, in, as I recall in your scoring in kind of the mid sixties um, for associative preference. Um, how how would you describe this dot connecting uh, style of learning or processing information? Um, my, it it kind of moves. It kind of say I'm even lost for words it just I think when you look at the results in front of you from taking taking this assessment um, and what it actually shows is the areas where you didn't realize you were actually good at and I think for me that was that was a key thing but bringing this back to Sailor I think one of the questions I've got to ask because I was really surprised by one of these results Sailor the observer which you scored 39 and I think on the premiere, at the premiere, um, I saw the way you 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 listened to people after the film and how you observed people and you went to people who were quieter and you spent so much time and energy listening to people, their stories, their past and their experience and how the film had moved them. And I was just really surprised by the observer side of you. I, I wasn't surprised by the listener because I just know that you, you are very good at listening and and I think one of the things, you know, I, I truly mean this as a compliment. I I saw Sailor as kind of a beautiful Black Panther that was in the room. Because let's face it, you know, to get the film, the, the film, you've not seen all of the film. The film has got such a Hollywood feel about it. And to be a director of film, of this kind of film, and be a producer and write it, means you've got to be fierce in some areas to make this actually happen. Mm. And I think what I saw that night is... You kind of, you know, everybody in that room was like your cubs. You were watching, you were observing, and you went to listen to people. And and I think the journey that you've been through was, is, is just incredible. And I think for me, I think you've got to go through a valley to get to the mountain. And I think for me, these kind of assessments really show areas where we just don't think about it. We, we just don't think enough sometimes about how powerful our minds are. Okay, sorry. No, no. <laughs> Interesting, but yeah, I also was a little surprised by that observer score because I feel like I do observe a lot, but and and maybe I just listen more than I observe. It could be a visual. Is it a visual kind of uh, observation that you're testing, or what? What kind of observation are you testing in that score? Gary, you want to take that? Well, okay, all right. So, because I'm like I'm shot out of a can, and I've had a lot of coffee this morning. So, so let me. <laughs> Let, let's see. Let's see if we can provide a little bit of context here, Sharon. What you said um, makes a lot of sense, I believe, with with perhaps where Sela was um, in in that particular forum, and you referred to her listening to what people were saying and leaning into that listening. I think um, in that uh, from that audience. This work on a broader scale uh, is based on Howard Gardner's work in multiple intelligences. Uh, Howard Gardner, um, you know, out of Harvard, has been doing this for over 35 or 40 years, right? I believe, Cam, if I have the number right, and, and working on the understanding of multiple intelligences. There is the notion um, that Gardner talks about, about a different preference that may activate another preference within a certain context. What you seem to be describing is that within that forum, you, you may have shown up on this, in this particular assessment as being a little bit lower on the observer side, which th th there's, th there is no preferred state. 
but the the it you could have absolutely activated that observer preference uh within the context of of that of that advanced listening that you were doing and and it could have started there there could have been this almost this energy going between the two i'm looking at your scoring right now and pointing to myself uh, uh as this as this uh, as we go through this so you know what garter described i believe if i have his, his language right is he talked about if you look at say the way this uh um, assessment is laid out uh you you have longer bars on it and a little bit shorter bars. Um, he talked about lasers versus a flashlight. The laser is, is really focused on, on, you know, perhaps in that, in that uh, setting, you really were listening in and leaning in on that. That could have activated the flashlight, which is observer. So in, the, in your normal life, if you're walking around, um, you observe the things that are, you're not a, a bad observer. You observe the things that, that are in front of you. The things that are directly in front of you. Um, I, I'm I'm an active observer, and I can get distracted when I walk around. When I'm driving, you know, things that are that interest me off to the side of the road. That I, like, wow, there's there's a constant decoding process. But as I said, I I think that maybe there there could be that notion of that uh, about whether when, or not when their you preferences. When you say observer, do you are you referring to a visual observer or an emotional observer, or in what sense? Active observers, active observers tend to, to be, um, help me with the language cam on this. I think that active observers are, are, are very, very much primed to decode human behaviors. Uh, we decode facial uh, uh, changes to face. We, we can pick up on people's body language. Um, we can look out ahead and say, this doesn't fit within the tapestry. Um, right. Something's wrong here. Uh, the, the founder of the survey actually talks about active uh, observer preference as being instinct. And, and sometimes uh, as an active observer, that gets me in trouble. Um, sometimes it serves me well uh, because, you know, my, my, the way that, uh, say, the way that I would look at it, say a Van Gogh is not the way somebody else would look at a Van Gogh. And, and I could stare at the thing forever because it's activating a lot in my brain. So, and I'll, I'll just add to that, Sayla. Um, I think that there's a there's a common misconception that, you know, say an artist, you know, a visual artist should be should be a high observer, right? Or a professional athlete should be a high mover. And so this is about preference and making meaning. It's not about um, necessarily aptitude, right? That you can paint beautiful pictures and have beautiful cinematography and not have that active observer. Uh, it's really about telling a story. Um, and so to just piggyback on what Perry was saying, it's the, uh, the making of meaning. Um, so that, that imagery has more meaning. Uh, it's the power of uh, symbols and like that a tree is more than, has more meaning than just being a tree, right? It's a symbol of something else. Um, and so, Again, as a, you know, I, I, my training is in professional coaching. And so coaching is about curiosity. It's about asking uh, questions out of curiosity, but it starts with listening. Uh, so that uh, we coaches, and, and uh, I actually did my training in California, so coaching came out of California about 20 years ago. Um, we coaches sort of distinguish listening at these different levels. Um, in the sense of you're listening to the, what the person's saying, but also you can listen at a higher level of uh, just the tone, the energy, there's uh, the inflection, and that you're going to pick that up as a high listener. You're going to pick that up more than others, where others, are, uh, say a selective listener, will just hear the language, the words. Um, but you're picking up a vibe, picking up something else. You're, there's uh, multiple layers to that listening for that active listener. Um, just as the same with an active talker, right? Is that, um, again, the, that language is a, a little, as Perry was saying, this tapestry, it's a little bit richer. Um, and again, there's no preference. I find that um, the, the people that I work who are high movers or active movers, it's not just about the movement piece. It's also they like motion in what they're doing. They like to see things happening and 
um, you know, projects moving forward. So it has a more of a meaning of just this uh, muscle movement. It's really interting stuff that we're finding out. All right. So let me, let me, let me help you out on this. Cause I'm, I've got an active associative thought going on here and Sharon, you, you're, you know, you, you also work in the medium as well. You're a filmmaker. Here's the difference. When I have seen the trailers for your movie, the thing that interests me about it is the tone. Um, how, you know, I, I like to find out more, uh, uh, you know, from, you know, who, you know, were you the cinematographer on this, uh, the close-ups, you know, the faces, the tone of it, which, which gave you, it gave me the sense in what little I've seen that that, that actively uh, uh, does associate with this notion of potentially of depression. Um, how you shot the film. A favorite film of mine is Tree of Life by Terrence Malick. Now, my, my wife Liz doesn't like Tree of Life at all. She's a little bit less on the observer side, but I could put that on and just stare at it over and over again because it is, number one, it's so highly associative, but the visual tapestry, it's just endless in my mind. Now that's what, what I relate that to is my active observer. And at the same time as an active listener, I can turn, I can shut my eyes and hear a completely different movie from Tree of Life. So, so again, uh, one, would, one would assume perhaps that, that Malik is a, an active observer, an active listener, that perhaps you know, related to that work. Um, but I always look at that movie and, and, and when I ask people, I said, you, did you ever see Tree of Life? The interesting thing about that movie is a lot of people say, oh, yes, I loved it. it. It was so many different layers. And other people say, I hated that movie. I couldn't take it. it just It overwhelmed me. I couldn't, I couldn't watch that at all. It reminds me of a movie years ago called My Dinner with Andre. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I remember the title. What, what, tell, tell us about that. Basically, two guys go out to dinner and talk for two hours. And that's the whole movie. They're just sitting at a table and talking. But they talk about very fascinating topics. I mean, it's from death to, you know, to reincarnation, to God, to, you know, it's just really, really fascinating and very deep. And, you know, and so I showed this to my husband and he just couldn't stand the movie. He said, oh my God, <laughs> it's like toys the root canal watching this movie. And I absolutely love the movie because I thought it was just this exchange of ideas was so fascinating, you know, and, and listening to the conversation. And uh, so, yeah, I think, there is some, some filmmakers are very, very visual. You know, it's just a series of, of pictures. Right. In fact, I saw one recently called Columbus. It was a small independent movie, but it's basically the entire uh, verbal dialogue could probably condense to four pages. You know? It's all a visuals, you know, a series right. of visuals. And some people just love that. I mean, that's not particularly my, my, my love of movies, but you know, it's, I think it relates to that different style. All right. Yeah. So here we go. Now we're unpacking this, Cam. You, uh, yeah. you, Cam Cam's expression is changing here. So go ahead, Cam. Let's talk about that a little bit, please. Well, so, so there's the movie maker and then there's the, the cinephile. There's the, the lover of movies and the lover. And so you just gave us insight into mm -hmm. what resonates for you is the, the storytelling, the dialogue. Or the exchange of the exchange of information right. and the, and these related topics that gets your attention. So, does that does that resonate with you, Sayla? Very much. But the verbal exchange. So let's go back here now and, and and let's talk about the second movie that you mentioned, which you know you said, eh, you know it's it's a visual tapestry and everything. But so so again, direct visual. Yeah. Um, perhaps resonate, you know, that goes back to that, that observer. Sharon, what do you think? I mean, when you um, give us an example of a movie that you say, wow, this movie blows me away. I could watch it over and over again. What, oh, what might that be? Psycho. Psycho. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Alfred Hitchcock, just, just wow. the way that, just the way he broke so many boundaries and, and the challenges he had for that film. And, and, and what many people don't know is that the noise of, of the, the stabbing was actually, um, uh -huh. me melons being stabbed and pieces of meat to get that so that he's, he was just a creative genius within that but and I think going back to what Cam said a minute ago what what Sailor says about you know she picks up on more than just words and then coming back to what you were saying Perry about the visuals within the film I think one of the things Sailor does really well is she spots micro expressions of people 
um, and, and she did this at the premiere and I think that's why I was you know curious about the low observer there but you know so she'll she'll pick up on these but then she'll go in and listen and I think she's done that with the film as well some of the close shots and, and some of the images that are used see you two have not seen the film but some of all I will say is the swimming pool image and and the scenes that are shot there is just so powerful and I don't want to give anything away but it's just the way Sailor makes the audience she just pulls you in and and I think that's missing today in some of the films so Sailor yeah you won me over it's just I, I just think this is brilliant so inspired thank you so much um you know one of the things I wanted to do with the movies um a lot of people said, well, you know, you're, you're going to make a movie about suicide. Like, why not do a documentary? I mean, if you want people to know more about this subject, you know, do a documentary. But I think it's one thing to know in a factual sense, you know, something that happens. It's almost like antiseptic. Like, you know, we've, for example, let's say we, the school shootings that are going on in America. Hmm. I mean, every other day we hear about a school shooting and we become almost like numb to the whole thing you know we don't feel it anymore and what i wanted to do with this movie is, is to to make the audience feel what it feels like to go through this issue you know to go through to either have a loved one or or yourself be going through this the issue of depression and feeling suicidal or and um that's why i think fiction is so powerful because it makes you feel rather than just think about it, it makes you feel what, what people are feeling. And, and I, that's what I wanted to achieve in this movie. So, so uh, let me ask a quick question. I'm sorry, Sharon, I cut you off, go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna say, and, and the fact that for the message of the film, it was shot in Silicon Valley and, and that message and was so powerful as well because the disconnect between families there and the disconnect between people and just wearing this badge of honor about working so hard not seeing what is going on around you so i think that was that was really powerful and i don't think you would get that as much you know with other things so with a feature film that really came across uh perry i'm kind of curious about um Sayla's creative process of kind of taking an idea. You said um, in one of your interviews, Sally, you, you said, I, I've come up with ideas every day. Um, I work with people who come up with ideas every day and they're overwhelmed with those ideas. And so they struggle with which one to push to the finish line. So here you are, you're taking this concept and, and I'd love to hear how you will start with this uh, idea and, and move it into something real. Um, and it, to a final product like uh, the Valley? Actually, that's a really great question. And, and so can I tag on that? Sorry to interrupt. How long did it take? How long from start four to finish? Years. From start four years. to finish. It's been four years. Wow. I mean, I had the idea a long time ago, but you know, when I started the script was four years ago. And wow. it took about a year to write the script. I went through nine revisions. And then hmm. um, it took about six months to eight months to get the money. To, you know, I got investors and I put in half of the money myself. And, um, and then another uh, year to do, you know, production, post-production. And then it's, an, it's been a year to roll it out. Wow. I've been to 25 different film festivals and now we're actually um, right on the cusp of, we did a theatrical, we started a theatrical in the UK. Um, the India theatrical will start a week from now and then we're on the cusp of starting the US theatrical. So we're, we're just, uh, it's a long road. It's a very long road. And, um, but the great question, you know, I, I had a similar test, um, not a similar, but a different test, but there's something called ideaphoria and it tests your ideaphoria. It's how, how rapidly ideas come into your head. And I was, uh, I was in the 99th percentile for that. <laughs> and so part of the problem I have is I have a lot of ideas. In fact, Sharon and I were talking about what we're going to do in the future together because I see a future project for us. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I could, I could think of six ideas just talking to her. Oh, I could, we could work on this. We could work on this. <laughs> and that was, so part of the problem you have is how to ferret out which idea you're going to work on and stay with and kind mm -hmm. of filter out those other ideas and, and stick with it because 
when you have a lot of ideas, there's this always this temptation to abandon one and work on the next one, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's just work ethic and kind of discipline, but it's, it's a real struggle for people with, and I'm sure there are many people like this. My, my children are like this, actually, one of my children. Where you get, you have a constantly you get a lot of ideas Sorry, and you have to figure out, okay, what am I gonna focus on, you know? So, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually challenge you there, Sela, okay. in, in a playful way. Mm -hmm. You said work ethic and discipline. And I'm going to, um, can we dig in beyond that? Like, what, what is your concept or what is your practice of work ethic? Uh, what is your practice of discipline? Like, how does that show up for you on any given day? I think once I commit to something, I become a little obsessive. So, for, I mean, you ha in, in order to get, make this movie happen, I really had to be because I don't have infinite resources. My resources are limited. So, um, so for example, with writing, I mean, I wrote every day, you know, four or five hours a day until I had it done. And then I started showing it to people. I had readers. And, um, you know, and I, some of them, their feedback's a little painful. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. become your baby. And I've gotten used to that now, but initially it took me a while to get used to that. Um, where, you know, they say, okay, I don't like this or I don't like that. And you think, well, but that's my favorite part, you know. <laughs> so, so then, you know, going through all the revisions. Again, I was, I was, I used to work every day. Um, so I think just stick to itiveness. It's, it's one thing that, you know, you have to cultivate. Okay. Um, so we just, uh, we interviewed Kiko Matthews, who just broke the world record uh, crossing the Atlantic. Yeah, go Kiko. Uh, go Kiko. Yeah. And um, we talked to her about sort of every day getting on that rowing machine or getting in that skull to row. Um, we've talked with S Stephanie Mill Millward about uh, a Paralympian getting in the pool. And it's so interesting to, this is, this is the stuff of leadership. This is the stuff of, of leaders that uh, when others are not necessarily you know, seeing the outcome or the, uh, the objective that you see so clearly, right. Of, um, and, and um, I'm really fascinated with motivation what motivates people to take something that is an idea, um, call it out from all these other ideas, and then commit in a way that you, you're, you go through this process of ownership and, and uh, an attachment, as you said, or sort of this is my baby, and then have that criticism. Others would just set it aside. They would put it down and not come back, mm -hmm. uh, not come back the next day. And so what is it that's in you that's unique to Sela? It has you come back on a consistent, right? That resilience that Sharon talks about, that ability to bounce back and get back into that writing chair, to get back to, you know, I mean, raising, there's raising. And there's a negative interpretation of this. <laughs> the negative interpretation might be fear. Like there's a certain component of fear of failure, right? That you don't want to fail. And um, part of that might be ego. That you you know you have an ego you want to, you want to be successful you want to be perceived as successful and you don't want to fail so fear and ego are maybe somewhat negative. The positive side of it, I think, this, to me, I I think of service to others, and um, that is a part of me that I that I think motivates me a lot. Like, for example, I had investors. Four, four investors who invested significant amounts of money in the movie. I'm a first-time director. They're all my friends. I feel this enormous amount of responsibility that I have to, you know, I have to really be true to them and try to do my very best, you know, make the best movie I can and try to launch it and try to return their investment and do what I can, you know. So that's one component of service is serving, you know, I, I feel very grateful to them and I, wa I want, I feel responsible to them. 
The second component of service is I feel, in fact, it should be reversed actually. I think the most important thing is, I feel like this could have a real potential benefit to people. People who are struggling, people who are, you know, I want to like prevent these catastrophes from happening in other people's lives if possible. And I think a lot of it is awareness, you know? Awareness for the person who's undergoing this, because a lot of people aren't aware of what, that they're not alone. You know, a lot of, many people are feeling the same way, not expressing it, you know? That isolation and loneliness is a huge component of why people sort of get worse and worse in depression and sort of make this horrible choice. So, and the second is people around them to kind of look at the signs, like, and to try to see that maybe their superficial, like, goals and motivations, you know, if some catastrophe like this happens, everything looks very insignificant by comparison. Like, you know, you may be wondering, well, what will the neighbors think if they knew my kid was depressed, you know? <laughs> right, and then, right. But, but the thing is, if something like this happens, what the neighbors think is the last thing on your, on your list that you care about. You could care less at that point. So it's like the, the, the trivial things we obsess on become, look very insignificant, in, you know, when you see the entirety of the problem. So, so that's something I think the movie does impress on people, you know? In fact, one person told me, one parent, they went back and started thinking about all of the things they do with their children and whether they do some of the things that I put in the movie, you know, about, and then they said they, they couldn't sleep the whole night because they were just, they were just thinking, you know, do I do the right things with my child? And they went home and hugged their kids, you know? And I thought, wow, if this movie makes everybody go home and hug their kids, it's not such a bad thing. You know, right. that it's having right. that kind of fact. So, so what I'm hearing, um, Cam and Sayla and Sharon is that, you know, so you committed to there was an emotional commitment to this idea. You you grounded yourself in the commitment to your investors, and and you you put the bar up in front of you and said, okay, now it's time to roll. And that that you know that foundational grounding around that big idea uh, is in many many cases, I believe, Cam. You know, for high associates, that really is what pushes you forward. There's. Um, we we talk with a lot of sports and uh, sports uh, personalities and athletes as well. Um, you know the grounding uh, to the commitment, uh, uh, you know, toward excellence or whatever the goal is. You know, on the playing field or in Kiko's case, she said, you know, she gathered a lot of people around her, and and they supported her. And her commitment to them was that she was going to break this record. You know, come hell or high water, no pun intended, and she certainly did. She didn't stop. Because she knew in her mind there, this emotional commitment, which goes, Cam, I think to you know, the, you know, some of the ideas that you talk about really around, around accountability, you know, around curious accountability, um, innate curiosity, but at the same time grounded in a certain sense of accountability. Um, do I have that right? Yeah, I think that. Um, so, accountability in the sense of um, related to living in integrity, right? Of uh, waking up and feeling good about your contribution. And um, you know, so, so again, when, when uh, Sayla talks about this responsibility and service, it's sort of a, that there's a, well, and Sayla, please um, you know, correct me here, but you sort of put it out to the world, you know, to your investors, to your supporters of your very, um, public about what you were doing. This is what I'm doing. And sort of put that expectation out there, right? You put the, you didn't keep that bar uh, to yourself. You didn't hide it, did you? You didn't hide it. The other thing that I'm noticing is, um, I think this is where this sort of um, sense of identity, right? And, and uh, that you're a, you're a connector, right? You see connection as uh, paramount and that, um, depression is where there's an absence of connection and that this you've developed this uh this movie as a gift because it is a connecting it's a vehicle to connect right as sharon was saying as you walk around the room people are resonating with this story um and so that vision of 
I can do something for the greater good. Um, because Kiko didn't just row across the Atlantic to break a record. She rowed across the Atlantic to um, raise money for uh, the hospital to save, you know, to save other people, to save children with cancer. Right? That, that bigger, compelling motivation. And I, th I see that, not that a high sequential won't have that, but high associatives with that that element of, of context. The mission. The mission. The, yeah. the, the, as we say in, in, uh, at Avalon um, and the CPP, the why, right? The why needs to be very compelling and connected to that. Right. So, so, so I'm going to, so let me ask this, Sela, because I think this is important here. You, you had your, your debut in India. You, you also were, you know, put, put the work in front of um, you know, audiences in the UK. Talk about the universal idea, the universal connection, what you were trying to accomplish. How did that resonate or, or what were the differences between those audiences? Is this a universal theme that people understood? Um, I think that's very important. You know, that's a really good question because one of the aspects of the story is it deals with an Indian American family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, the first producer I went to said, you know, you shouldn't make them Indian American, just make them mainstream American. You know, why, why do you do that? Because you're limiting your audience. And I've, you know, to, from that point till now, I've questioned myself, like, did I do the right thing? Because, you know, I think the road would have been a lot easier for me if I had made the mainstream left. I think I would have probably gotten a distributor right away. I mean, I would have, I think it would have been easier. Um, but first of all, I think there's something special about the immigrant story because Everything that people feel here is accentuated for immigrants. Like that whole sense of needing security and wanting to be successful. And, you know, everyone has that in, in America. It's part of the American mm -hmm. psyche, right? That's pressure. Mm -hmm. Pressure. But with, Mer with immigrants, it's actually more intense because you've left, you've given up all your connections back in the home country. And it's true, whether if you go back 100 years, it was the Irish or the, you know, whoever it was that happened to be the immigrants of that time, it's true for all of those people. They've given up their homeland ties. They've come here and they're kind of isolated, right? And they're trying to get all of those things that the American dream, you know, wealth and whatever it is that, you know, the goal is. So that pressure is accentuated. And the, the next generation, they put all that pressure on that next generation because they're, they're limited because they're the first generation immigrants. They're limited what they can do. So they think that the next generation, the dreams get even bigger, mm -hmm. you know? And that's kind of how it's always been here, right? So I think the fact that they're immigrants was, was kind of a necessary component of the story. But to answer your question, I feel like the, the story could be anybody. If you change some of the names and some of the, you know, food names or whatever, it becomes a mainstream American story. It really is not, the fact that they're immigrants is, is incidental to the story, right. but it's not an integral, you know, necess necessary aspect. So I feel like everyone can, could relate to it. I mean, whether they're in the UK, whether they're in, you know, you heard Sharon, right? She, she related to it perfectly and she's a, you know, a Londoner, right? So. <laughs> well, depression doesn't discriminate, so. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, that that um, that goes back to you know a little bit on a broader sense of the word. This goes back to some of Joseph Campbell's work. You know, this is hero with a thousand faces, and you know, this is universal themes, sociocultural myth. Um, if, if you know the audiences in the UK, if they reacted to it in the same way as as um, you know or similar ways as to you know audiences in in India, well, you have something on your hands. You know, so. So maybe that one producer who, uh, and you know, you didn't name that producer, but maybe that one producer is going to turn, you know, around here pretty soon and say, hmm, you know, maybe I didn't give her the right advice. And maybe the advice that you took was the advice you needed to take. I mean, I remember a movie a uh, number of years ago, maybe 20 years ago, I believe I have the title right, called Mississippi Masala. Do you remember oh, yeah. that movie? Mm -hmm. I mean, again, a, the movie about outsiders coming in and trying to, trying to just have a life. Mm -hmm. uh, that resonated. I thought that was a wonderful film. Um, it was a good movie. Yeah, it was, it was excellent. Well, that, you, you answered a question that I had about that. Um, you know, one, one thing 
that you mentioned that I, I heard in a previous uh, interview as well is that is that you thought that the film could make a difference, um, and I think you're you're reflecting that back. Um, I mean, this is this is a very very strong message, and so we'd encourage people definitely to get out and see it. Let, let's talk a little on the sequential side. Talk about your U.S. rollout, if you will. What what's on the schedule? I know that in in a preliminary interview, just for the audience, we did talk about um, uh, opening in New York, I believe. Um, down at, uh, down at the Village or Greenwich Village Theater. Will you tell us about that? Sure. Um, so it, it, right now, it's, it's definitely going to be in uh, the Village Cinema in uh, Greenwich Village on June 8th, the week of June 8th, and Lemley Theater in LA the week of June 8th. And I'm currently uh, negotiating with AMC, so to do like a 20-screen uh, okay. rollout across the major cities in the U.S. So that'll be June 8th. It's going to be the premiere. And uh, it'll be on VOD in the July time frame. So Blu-ray, VOD, streaming, et cetera. So. Perfect. To, uh, remind him, uh, what, uh, what's the status of your Georgetown, potentially Georgetown or DC rollout? Did you, you had some uh, contacts at Georgetown that were helping you out? Yes. Uh, so we're, we're actually uh, dealing with, we've reached out to about 520 student organizations across the country. And uh, we are licensing the movie so that they can show it to their, you know, constituents and members. And uh, what we're doing with that is we're basically providing discussion notes along with the movie. Because the last thing on earth we want is for this to be a triggering kind of, have a trigger triggering effect, which the movie is actually specifically designed not to do that. But so with these discussion notes, what we hope to do is, is kind of elevate the dialogue, like talk about this, watch the movie and talk about the topic, you know. Perfect you know, do you have friends who are feeling this way? Do you, you know, and so on. And what are the trust signs? What are the organizations that are, that you can reach out to to help? And uh, so that's what we're doing with that. And we've actually um, gotten about 14 universities, which are uh, in the process of licensing the movie. And uh, we're working on others. That's great. That's awesome. You know, what, here's an associated thought for you. We, we do um, uh, some work with members of the military and we talk about the same themes and, and especially people, um, you know, reintegrating into society after they've been out on deployment for, for a while. And this is a very, very uh, a common and, and, and theme that's at the forefront of a lot of their thinking. Um, you know, how, how, do you, how do you come back uh, after things that you've seen, you know, and all the emotional impact? Um, so I, I would definitely, if, if, you know, use that, uh, make that a recommendation to anyone listening, you know, check it out. Uh, it's not just necessarily about families. This is a very, very universal um, uh, type of message. So, so I think we could talk forever. <laughs> I'd like to continue doing it. I know we have to kind of come to an end. Um, I have one last question for you. I'm going to put you on the spot here. So I, I was doing a little bit of uh, reading and, and um, Bergman, you know, uh, the, you, you look at the, his, uh, his filmography. Bergman once, I believe he was quoted in the New York Times a long, long time ago. He said that when he finished a movie, it had a cathartic effect on him. He said he was driven out of his obsessive nature to finish the movie. And when it was over, he was grounded again. And then he would build up to the next movie. Uh, and, and I said, I wanted to ask you about that. It, has it had a cathartic effect or will this be an extension of the journey is my question to you. No, I, I think that's definitely true. And it's, it's a really interesting point. I, I feel that not just the audience, but I've learned a lot out of this movie. I mean, first of all, just the general process. I mean, from I've done from A to Z, the entire business and creative side of the movie. So, you know, I've been involved with. So I learned so much from that point of view, but also about the topic. It made me think more about the whole topic of anxiety and depression and how we judge and the stigma associated with I mean, whether we admit it to ourselves or not, there's a little component of us that's judgmental. Like we see someone who's suffering from mental health issues and we say, oh, you know, we, we always have this natural inclination to judge them. And, you know, for me, it's kind of cured me of that because it's made me more empathetic and more compassionate towards people who are suffering, which I think, you know, I hope it, it does that for others as well, like who are watching the movie. I might just say um, judge and uh, recoil right? Judge and, and move away. Yes. And, and disconnect, right? To uh, not go and connect and reach out. But that judgment, there's a behavior that goes with that is to 
uh, step back. Right. Yeah. So you're stepping in here, mm -hmm. right? Stepping toward. Sharon, what do you think? I can't see you, but I know your I know your mind is working here. I want to give you a give you the opportunity to jump in, please. Well, I think Cam's kind of covered it because I was going to ask is at Sailor is how do you know when to walk away when the story is finished? You no, know, because it's it's so easy, isn't it, to continue with things? So when do you know to walk away from it? That's it. That's the final call. That's it. It's done. That's a really good question. I. Um... I've given myself a timetable because I could be in this forever. I mean, it's, it's, it's <laughs> but I think by about the end of this year, I'm going to, first of all, I've, I've got this idea, which I think I'm going to, I'm feeling the impetus to start working on it now. So I think that will help me to separate from this one, this one. So. All right, Sally, you ready for, all right. what is the idea? <laughs> <laughs> Just I'll, I'll talk to Sharon about, about it, but this one is a real winner. I'm telling you. So it's a great oh, I think I know. Sailor's working on a winner. Of All right. More information. <laughs> I think it's been great. Sailor, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciated that. And um, we're hoping that you'll, you'll stay in touch here and, and jump back on here, uh, obviously, with, with the next project that you're working on. And we also want to continue talking with you, um, you know, about this a very important topic that you cover in the movie. So Sailor's giving you guys the time frame. Uh, get out and see the film. It is coming up here, um, and I'm sure it's going to be making some really, really very, very positive waves um, here in the States um, for this rollout. Cam, last word. I will stop talking. Yeah, just uh, so Sailor, your, you know, this, this, uh, you, your objective here, the, the words you used were, were, were uh, elevate dialogue, right? And... Um, this is such an area that needs to have the, the dialogue elevated. So just hats off to you for being so bold and courageous to, to do this, um, to normalize uh, this condition of depression and anxiety, and um, to keep doing the good work you're doing. So, and thank you for coming on to Wired to Lead. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks again, Sailor. All right. We'll talk soon. Many thanks to our guest today. And if you enjoyed this podcast and want to know more about how you are wired to lead, go to www.avalonleadership.com where our roundtable is always open. Once again, the assessment is called the Cognitive Peak Profile and it might actually change your life. For more info on the Avalon Institute and our advisory services and other products, send an email to info at avalonleadership.com. Special thanks to our producer, Brendan Kaunaki of Washington, D.C.-based Kaunaki Media. Please visit his website at www.kaunakimedia.com. Thanks for joining us, and please tune in to our next broadcast, always available on SoundCloud.